Hello, everyone. Welcome to CoreCast. This is your host, Tim. And this is Sahil. So today, uh, unfortunately, our, our uh, third member, Mikey, won't be able to join us, but uh, he may or may not pop in. So we'll, we'll see what happens. Um, so before we, before we get to it, for logistical things, please post any questions or comments you have in the YouTube section, the comment section, so that way you can get to them during the episode. So without further ado, let's, let's get into it. So, so Tim, I, I was really, I was going through a craze this, uh, starting this week of trying to get a particle named after me and I wanted to discover my own particle. So what, what do I got to do? Well, how, how much money will it take? What do I need to do? Yeah. So that's, that's a great question. Um, so, so let me borrow a quote from uh, Carl Sagan. He's, he said that, uh, if you want to recreate a uh, apple pie from scratch, you got to recreate the universe universe. And unfortunately for us to discover a particle, something similar needs to happen. Uh, to some extent, we kind of have to recreate, first of all, some very extreme conditions, uh, very close to the beginning of the universe. And then uh, at the same time, we also have to understand it very well. So, huh. and, and for, um, as, part of, uh, as particle physicists, the only way we know how to do that is to create a massive, massive uh, accelerator. So unfortunately, Sahil, I think I think that the, the bill you're looking for, it's it's somewhere north of in, in the order of, in the order of billions. Not impossible, <laughs> but probably more than that. Ah, uh, well, if you got a billion dollars, I'm more than happy to take it, and then uh, and you'll get back nothing except the glory of having a particle name discovered potentially, maybe, <laughs> maybe not. Um, so what do you mean like recreate the, the early conditions of the universe? What, what does that have to do with particles? Yeah. So the interesting thing is, so, so, so let's just take, uh, real life right now. Um, we know that the types of particle we see are quite limited. So with, with everyday interaction, for example, uh, I'm, I'm looking at my hand, I'm looking at the screen, the computer, everything is made of things like electrons and uh, atoms and, and the nucleus of atoms are made of protons and, and neutrons and and those are also subsequently made up of quarks and gluons and those are pretty much uh, these are the known particles that we that we've we've studied them pretty well so so you ask the question well okay if there is a new particle where where are they basically so the only way for those particles to be accessible well at least one way is that maybe they existed for a, um, maybe they existed in the early universe when the universe ju was just created, but then since then they've decayed into some other more stable particles. That tends to be the trend for most of the new particles we have seen. Um, of course, there's an alternative possibility. It's possible the particle was there, but we just couldn't see it for some reason. So we don't know, we, we don't know of its existence so far. But um, so history also has some of that, some of those as well. Wait, so why do you suspect that in the early universe there were particles that you hadn't seen before? Aren't there only, like, all, all the particles that you mentioned, like, those were there in the early universe, but were there more, or what, what's going on with that? Uh, actually, we've come to know that there were a lot of, a lot more particles in the early universe because uh, the universe was a lot denser, uh, the temperature was a lot hotter, like, super duper hot. We're talking about beyond million or billions or even trillions of uh, degrees Celsius or Kelvin, if you like. So at those in intense temperatures, uh, particles would live a lot longer, even though, if, even though, even though the universe was not, um, even though the universe at that point wasn't very old then, it was only like uh, maybe less than a minute old or something like that. So, so and, and historically we have discovered particles that only live a very short amount of time. And these are things like the, the W bosons, the Z bosons, uh, different flavor of quarks, different types of quarks, uh, like the charm quark, the bottom quark, and more recently, the top quark. By recent, I mean still like decades, decades old by, by now. So things like that. And so historically, uh, we pretty much the majority of the particles we discover that don't exist now probably existed somewhere in the early universe when when the 
when the conditions were, were more favorable, there were more energy to create them. Uh, but now that now the universe has cooled down a lot. It's very cold, basically. The outer space is very cold. It's like absolute uh, close to absolute zero temperature. So if I had like a hot enough oven and I just stuff a bunch of particles in there and just turn up the heat, would that do it or would it well, like would much, that fail? That's pretty much <laughs> what you need to do. Although at that extreme temperature, uh, heat is probably not the the way to describe it. Yeah, it, it, and to some extent. Uh, that this is the reason why particle physicists we build uh, super super energetic particle accelerators accelerators that use tremendous amounts of energy to collide particles and effectively creating super super hot temperatures such that hopefully with those amounts of energy they can fuse into something new and then we can see uh, the, the 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 outcome of this creation. And the subsystem dec decay and, and and analyze these events. Huh. So so what you're saying is if I were to turn up the heat, it, it would do that. But how how do you turn up the heat? I, I can't go to Best Buy and buy an oven that does that, right? It would have to be something else. Yeah, unfortunately, no. So so we so we have to go through the the sort of possibility. How can you create temperatures that hot? To, cre to, to, have, to harness that much energy to, to create those extreme conditions. We, you can just sort of go down the list. Well, first of all, we can't, be, because we don't have such techno technology and we, we don't have, and, and it will require tremendous power to heat up the, something like the size of the oven to that kind of temperature. So that's out of the window. We can't, we just cannot have that much energy in, um, in, in, in such a large area. So you, ha you have to concentrate it in a really small volume. So, so basically that comes down to, um, in, in order to concentrate as much energy into particles, the best way to do it is to uh, pretty much head-on collision. Just imagine like, you know, what is the most damage uh, a, a car accident would have is, you know, when two car hits head-on, right? Yeah. So then, then, then you can go down the list given the, the types of particles we have, which is electrons and protons and neutrons, you, you know, things that, are, thing, things, things that are easily accessible, we can just accelerate them as much as possible and smack them against each other to create such extreme temperature and then hopefully see what comes out. So this is, what, uh, this is one of the reasons for building these particle accelerators. They can accelerate protons, electrons, or or antiprotons or anti-electrons and so forth. Yeah, so so one question about that. You've mentioned the word temperature several times. I want to dig into that a little bit. So in the case of like statistical mechanics where there are lots of particles, I think of temperature as this kind of macroscopic quantity. But if you just have like two particles by themselves in like vacuum or hypothetical vacuum and they collide with each other, what does temperature mean? Like what, what does that even mean? How does that apply? Yeah, well, to some extent, temperature is probably not the best word uh, word to describe the situation, uh, and, and probably okay. this is what what you're referring to, and 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 a lot of times we we just use uh, kind of the the center of mass energy for these collisions. Mm -hmm. So so yeah, so in some sense, it, it's just it, the temperature is is almost irrelevant. It's just we need as much energy as possible, so that so that particles can fuse into something new so that we can see them. Ah, uh, okay, okay. So, so what you're actually saying is more of energy scale rather than temperature and using temperature as a proxy for energy scale. Yeah, pretty much. Ah, yeah. uh, okay, okay. That, that, that makes a lot of sense. So I guess, like, what, what does, like, a new particle mean? Like, I can understand intuitive, like, kind of amorphously, like, what that means, that it's different than everything else you've seen before, but... What is that process like? Could you walk us through maybe a historical example that you're comfortable with? Yeah, absolutely. So, so, his, so, 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 one might ask the question, like, what do we care, you know, new particles or not? But in terms of particle physics, new particles really just means new physics. Anytime you introduce something, let's say a new force or a new interaction, what that usually means is um, a lot of times is that it comes. The, these things exist because of the new particles, and 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 in, to some extent, the 
particle physics is, is kind of like a reductionist point of view. You know, you, 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 you basically reduce everything to their constituents, and those constituents mm -hmm. are just sort of by default their particles, right? Mm -hmm. So new particles really means new physics. Um, a very good example is going all the way back, uh, the, the discovery of the, the antimatter, I, I think a good example is maybe antiprotons or anti anti-electrons. I don't know. The, I don't remember the story. Um, so 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 people you, people uh, back in the days people didn't know that antimatter existed. They're just like, well, you know, uh, who knows? You know, may, antimatter maybe not antimatter. Um, but that but then uh, one of the physicists Dirac comes along and comes up with these equations to describe things like electrons and and protons, these are fermions, and he noticed a mathematical oddity. He, he basically realized that he, in order for, to, for him to create an equation that's mathematically consistent, there has to be the notion of sort of like an like a, like anti version of that particle. Uh, by anti means that the charge, pretty much every property has to be opposite, except things like mass mm. and energy and whatnot. And this is sort of analogous to positive numbers and negative numbers. It's like, hey, in order for addition and subtraction to be complete, like you can, you can subtract a larger number from a smaller number, you need to have neg negative numbers, right? Otherwise, it wouldn't make sense. It's a similar vein. In order for the mathematics to be complete, to make sense, you kind of need, need like a mirror version of the ordinary particles, antiparticles. Um, so that's what Dirac found out. And people went, went on for a long time. They couldn't find it. And, and it turns out... Um, the discovery back in the days, uh, it, 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 it turns out they, they look at these images. I think they're bubble chamber images. Um, mm -hmm. th so, so these are not quite like accelerators. So accelerator is, is, is we smacking things together, right? But bubble chamber, uh, it's, it's looking at cosmic rays. And to some extent, there are particles coming from the cosmos uh, entering Earth, really energetic. So, so, so the, mm -hmm. our galaxy is kind of like an accelerator. So they're the accelerating these particles and charging onto Earth. And then the people were taking these pictures. They're like, well, you know, let, let's try to find, find, find a proton or, or antiproton. And for a long time, they couldn't find it. But then the reason is because, is because people didn't look carefully enough. It turns out the mm. only, well, because protons and antiprotons are very similar. Right. The yeah. only difference, I actually, I forgot the story, whether it was electrons or protons. But but, but anyway, the, the, the story it goes like this. Right. Um, so so the reason people didn't see it is because they didn't weren't looking carefully enough because protons and antiprotons are very similar, except their charge. One is opposite or the other. So yeah. as 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 proton enter the detector, it will curve uh -huh. one way if it was an ordinary proton, which is has a, has yeah. a positive charge. And if it has mm -hmm. a negative charge, it will curve the other way, but exactly mirror the pattern. So for a lo long time, uh. people just, just didn't look carefully enough. But, you know, lo and behold, when people start looking carefully, be like, hey, let's check out which way it curves. They discover that, oh, man, you know, the, the particles are right here in, in front of our eyes. We can see it in these, in these photographs. And then that, that's how the discovery was made. It was, it was pretty startling. They're like, hey, just look at these pictures. It's literally right in front of our eyes that they are identical twins of protons, but except it's opposite. It's like the mirror counterpart. Gotcha, gotcha. That, that makes sense. Let me move to an audience question um, before we, uh, we, we miss it. Um, so is there such thing as a maximum temperature? It's like a minimum, which is like zero Kelvin. But if you go with based on other definitions, you get negative temperature. But that's a separate discussion. But is there a max temperature? Uh, not really. Not really. I don't believe so. Uh, maybe theoretically there could be. Because if, if there's... Two, so, so temperature pretty much just, just measures the average. Uh, the average kind of uh, kinetic energy or, or energy due to movement of particles around us. So... So in principle, there's no upper limit, but of course, theoretically, if you have too much energy in a region, everything collapses into a black hole, so that, that can't happen. So I would say, like, maybe there's a theoretical limit, but only when, when it's so hot that gravity becomes very strong. We don't even know what temperature means anymore. This is like the beginning of the universe. 
So you, so you mm. could argue that there, there was a maximum temperature and it occurred at the beginning of the universe when things were created. Gotcha, gotcha. Yeah, no, that does make sense. If you go above a certain temperature, you're confining a certain amount of energy into a space and then a black hole forms. And then the notion of temperature just it's kind of out of whack. Um, so I, I wanted to I wanted to ask you, um, so going back to what it means to discover a new particle, like nowadays, kind of how how do they do it? You have this giant billions of dollars uh, you know, worth of, uh, you know, experiments that are running through this accelerator and then particles collide and they get, you know, what, what does that look like? What do they get from it? And, and how do you kind of like look at the data to see if there's a new particle? Yeah. Great question. So let me bring back in the story we just went through, you know, people okay. looking at these images, particles coming from the, from the cosmos and analyzing them. Uh, nowadays, the story is somewhat similar, except everything is at scale now. We have supermassive colliders. So, so the one that's currently, I'm not sure if it's running right now. The most powerful one is in Geneva uh, and the border of borderline France. I think it's, um, uh, the, the, the ring is about a little more than like a marathon distance. So it's, it's super large and, and, and it's mm -hmm. basically the most powerful accelerated, accelerated particles. And they have multiple detectors. Uh, so two of them are specifically for these discoveries, ATLAS and CMS. These are just acronyms. Uh, they are basically cameras to take pictures of these snapshots uh, so mm -hmm. that they can process these billions and billions of proton, proton collision events. And the one before this uh, massive collider was well, uh, Tevatron at Chicago at Fermilab. Mm -hmm. so, so it used to be in the United States. And they, and they collide something slightly different, protons and antiprotons. Um, hmm. So, yeah, so, so pretty much you collide protons, uh, antiprotons, but jillions and bajillions of times. And the reason why we put, collide protons is protons proton is just so accessible. You can, you can have many of them and they're heavy, so you can really collide them really well. Yeah. Um, so so you, got, you got billions and billions of collect, collisions every second. And you have yep. supercomputer centers, uh, the worldwide grid, grid computing, to just analyze these pictures basically every nanosecond, just boom, 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 to see and to see if there's some weird behavior, pretty much. Mm -hmm. um, and everything is automated. There's big data in there. Physicists are constantly building new algorithms, testing them, using statistics to see if something is different than what we expect. Uh, what what does it mean to be different than what do you expect? Like, actually, let me let me take a step back. What do you expect? <laughs> yeah. So so going back to the Carl Sagan analogy, you know, in order to do anything, <laughs> you kind of have to you kind of have to under you kind of have to recreate the whole universe, or at least understand it, or at least recreate it. Kind of how do I put this? Um, theoretically. So so in order for us to 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 even make any discovery, the first step is we have to understand the accelerated environment extraordinarily well. So what mm -hmm. happens is we have immense amounts of simulation technology. We have a lot of code to simulate every part of the detector to great accuracy. And we also interface that with physics. So we have, we have this uh, model called the standard model of particle physics. And and it has, it has the properties of every single particle, which is fit very well to data. And we have computer code that simulate what happens when two protons come in, collide, create other particles, and those other particles going through different types of detectors and will leave some uh, patterns or imprint in those detectors and what those pictures look like. So we have a whole enterprise of supercomputing resources to see, hey, what should the pictures look like when we collide protons? So we can compare those against experiments. Gotcha, gotcha. So you collide a lot of these things and you, you run simulations to understand the environment really, really precisely. And that's what you expect. So if, if you get something that you don't expect, then, then what happens? Wow, so... Um, <laughs> I, I would say that, 
particle physicists are probably some of the most conservative, and by conservative, I mean in terms of scientific conservatism. Uh, yeah. Not not nothing political. These are probably some <laughs> of the most scientifically conservative scientists, right? So basically, yeah. If something does not follow the simulation, the first line of suspect is that our simulations are wrong. <laughs> Like no one <laughs> in their right mind will ever think that hey, uh, maybe the physics is different. So basically, the rule, the rules, the rules of engagement is always to assume the entire enterprise something is messed up, and then you you look at every single little detail, and if those yeah. every single detail turns out to be right, you ver you double check, triple check everything. And then you compare yep. two different experiments com run by completely different scientists, collaborations mm -hmm. and, you know, code and everything. Then yep. you might think that, hey, maybe there's something there, but, but not yet. What you will claim, the and the only thing you can claim is there is a discrepancy. This is when you announce there's a discrepancy, but that's, that does not make a discovery yet. Ah. Uh. I see. Then, then what? Then what happens? Like, out of curiosity. Yeah. So when there's a discrepancy, usually, usually there's a lot of conferences, meetings, and people uh -huh. in those conferences might scream at each other, but you know, in a very, in, in a very, um, in a very polite way, basically, they be like, "Ah, oh, I think you did this wrong. <laughs> this thing, you probably underestimated something. Your errors are wrong." Okay. So, so that's, that's what happens first, okay? People argue against each other. Something's wrong, okay? And if, if that also goes through, then, then, then of, co of course, the, the theorists are different. We're talking about experimentalists here. They, they, they will yeah, yeah, argue yeah. extraordinarily rigorously. Of course, theorists will do some of the arguing too. So yeah. theorists need to come in and, and ultimately be like, hey, guess what? You know, I don't think it's a fluke. I don't think you guys did anything wrong. It's actually new <laughs> physics. So the theorist's job is to say, hey, this is, here's the status quo, the standard model, which, it, which everyone has, has a simulation tool to do this. Okay, the theorist's job yeah. is to say, hey, I believe there's new physics. Let, let's, call, let's call it model prime, you know, this, this uh -huh. new physics model prime. It's the physicist's job to plug that model prime into all the simulation code to think about, hey, what if it's true? what would happen when I collide protons and protons? You need to translate uh -huh. the theory into experiment. And not just that, once you do that, you have to run a new simulation and be like, hey, what, what would the, be the alternative look like? Yeah. But, but that's not all. You have to check every single existing experiment and to see if your model is inconsistent with every previous observations, pretty much. You have to check, that, make sure oh, that wow. first. Because otherwise, they're like, dude, you're wasting my time. <laughs> Ten years ago, we, we tried this, and you were wrong, right? So yeah. when you do that, once you do that, then maybe you can publish a paper and say, hey, guess what? My model has a shot to be right, and it might conform to data. Oh, wow. <laughs> That's so much work. Yeah, pretty much. That's why that, that that's the job of a um, of a of a theoretical particle physicist to some extent. Ah, uh, that is uh, that's quite extensive. So I want to I want to ask. Uh, I've been neglecting some of the audience questions, so I'm gonna I'm gonna get to them right now. Um, when you discover new particles, do you ever have to conclude what you thought before was wrong, or just it makes sense and just a nice add-on to what we currently know? I think that's kind of like tied into what you were talking about before. Yeah, so so physicists have a strong uh, assumptions that the prior is correct. That we always say, hey, mm -hmm. um, you know, with, with all things equal, we probably prefer the current model as opposed to something else. And 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 it's not just just because it's because the the model, the standard model, uh, ha, 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 has been through many many experiments, thousands probably. And not a single one of them has, you know, has rejected standard model, right? So the status quo is there, um, of course. Um, and, um, and so in order for us to propose a new model, it has to do something, something useful, right? 
so, so, so first of all, if there's a discrepancy in data, which, which, which we have quite a few actually uh, currently, we, we actually do have quite a few discrepancies, um, the model either has to resolve some of the discrepancy and say, hey, guess what? Your discrepancy is accounted for by my model. My model actually explained that. Um, then, then maybe it's useful, then you'll publish a paper. Uh, and, and hopefully, comes, comes, hopefully theoretical niceties comes along. Like you, you, like you want some nice looking model. You don't want to just add like a, a 20,000 new particles just to explain one thing. Like that's, that's foolish, basically. <laughs> you you kind of want the most simplest extension, basically, like the smallest, the most lightweight, and the most, I don't know, like the nice looking model. Then you can propose it. Pretty much. Yeah. Gotcha, gotcha. Um, so the next question is: uh, You mentioned collisions several times. Like, what does that look like to the naked eye? Um, so, so everything happens at the speed of light, and um, and really, you don't see very much. But but of course, <laughs> but of course, you can look at the pictures that 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 are that are captured. So pretty much, a proton comes in, uh, and I mean, I mean, I mean, as the proton come in, even though the proton is composite, it's pretty much an elementary particle, right? It's just like a, like a super intense beam coming in and collisions happen mm -hmm. and just a bunch of particles come out. These are just like, um, tracks. So you can, you might see tracks if the particles are charged, uh, they will curve because there's a very strong magnetic field. Some particles are not charged like neutrons and, and different types of mesons. They might not be charged. And they'll just deposit some heat energy in some of the silicon detector, or I think that depending on the detector, they, they might have different technology, like lead tungsten. They'll just left some energy behind. They, they, they're pretty much just kind of burning, you know, heat, lighting up some of the detectors, or maybe sometimes burning them, and then heat them up, mm -hmm. and then you just capture them with electronics. Um, so overall, not too exciting, but <laughs> but but you know, yeah, majority, you, but. It, to some extent, it's it's pretty much a picture. Some of the pix pixels get lit up basically as collisions happen. Ah, oh, that 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 makes sense. Um, then the other question is, why do you need to collide stuff so often? If it's really there, why wouldn't you see things happen all the time? Yeah. So the thing is, well, and the the reason the reasons are twofold. Um, so so if 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 there is something that doesn't happen so rarely, we probably would have seen it by now because we've been colliding things for a long time. <laughs> so, yeah. so, so any model you come up, any new physics model you come up, rem remember, if, 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 I'm, if I was a theorist, I had to do my due diligence to say that, hey, dude, <laughs> you, know, you don't need to waste your time. All the previous experiments are consistent. So in order for that to happen, these new particles better be super elusive super duper rare like that's the only way that they can remain undetected for so long um uh. and, and also because uh i neglect to mention that uh because of quantum physics you you never know you never know what happens you never know when uh when this part new particle will be created it's it's uncertain uh. so the only thing you can do is just try try more <laughs> and if it doesn't <laughs> succeed try even more like you know, there's nothing you can do. You just, you just got to keep trying. Yeah, no, that's, that, that's fair. So in the, in the time, in the few minutes that we have left, I, I think we should, uh, we should kind of, uh, what, what sort of, I guess the concluding remark that you want to get across? Yeah. So, so I would say that, um, discovering a particle is, is no small feat is, uh, is highly convoluted. And, and I would, I would strongly encourage you guys um, and any one of the interested audience to to check out this documentary, the Particle Fever, which documented the discovery of the Higgs boson. It's a mm. it's a multinational effort, and pretty much, you know, like Carl Sagan mentioned, we pretty much kind of recreate the universe on paper. We pretty much recreate, you know, all in simulations. <laughs> we have to recreate all that detector, simulate it. Compare, compare that to real data, and then it takes a team of scientists, engineers, statisticians, and theorists, experimentalists coming together, and just crank out some numbers, and at the end of the day, find out that, hey, well, well, well two things. 
first of all, the status quo is, does not match the experiment. Like that's the first step. But to find out that mm -hmm. it does not match, there's a discrepancy. But more importantly, the second thing, right? A lot of times science ends there, be like, hey, there's a discrepancy. But, but, but particle physics goes beyond. It says that, hey, sure, there's a discrepancy, but we need a new model to be able to, to, mm -hmm. to fit that discrepancy. So, so seeing, seeing a discrepancy is not enough. We need to find something that fits this, this discrepancy. And then when that happens, when we see that there's no other alternative, then we finally accept there's a discovery. Mm. Makes sense. Makes sense. That that sounds very uh, very arduous. <laughs> yeah. So I, I what I got from this is that if there's a discrepancy, you go through this whole like long long process of like people being very skeptical, and if all that clears, you have a new model that comes in, and you run a bunch of simulations, and you, that's what you expect, and then you see whether or not the signal you're getting matches that theory close enough that it's not considered by, um, it, it's not considered to, uh, you know, be different, but actually very close to what the theory predicts. Yeah, pretty much. And, and I sure do hope that, uh, you know, these, like, this is, I think, the gold standard for scientific uh, discoveries. And, and, and the last word, I, I know recently there's a, there's a lot of buzz about this, uh, this UFO report. I, I don't know if our audience are... <laughs> I've seen some of those as well. You know, this is a good example. I think in, in order to make any discovery about anything, we need to go through that step. There's a discrepancy, you know, let's do this due diligence. However long it takes, it might take years or decades, but, but this is how science is done. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I don't know about that, but <laughs> I don't know if they're going to apply it to that specifically, but we'll, we shall see. We shall see. Um, so with that, I'd like to thank everybody for joining us. Sorry we started late. It's some technical difficulties. I think I resolved. Uh, anything else you want to add, Tim? No, that's it. Um, and thank you, thank you for joining us. See you next time. Yep. Thank you, everybody. We'll see you next week. Bye.